Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the fourth Collector Conversations. Uh, I'm your host, Bill Cox, as always, and we've got a eclectic mix of people in the <laughs> chat this evening. As you can see, Ruben and Michael are our new victims, with Mikhail and James being our seasoned veterans. How is everybody doing this evening? <laughs> doing well, Bill. Good, good. Great. Being our seasoned veterans. How is everybody doing this evening? Doing well, Bill. Yeah, I'm not sure where that's coming from. I'm looking through to see if I can stop. Not me, I'm on buds. Hey, Yeah, I'm not sure where that's coming from. Yeah, I've cl I've closed like every tab as well. Well, one way or another, I think it stopped. So we're good. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, sorry about that. It, it could have been ready for technology. Yes, exactly. All right. So, uh, uh, James, I know that uh, you, you've got a, you just said you're high on energy today. So do you yes. feel like like starting us off? I will. I, I was uh, mentioned before, and uh, I'm just doing intermittent fasting, and I'm on uh, 24 hours of a 48 hour fast just to see if I can do it. But uh, hey, it's so far so good. Um, no hanger pains or anything like that. But let's go ahead and kind of get started. <laughs> um, actually, uh, so this one is going to you know usually uh, when I've done a couple topics in in, in the past, uh, it's been kind of a structured an organized discussion, uh, something in particular. But uh, on this particular one, I wanted it to be an open flowing dialogue with everyone on the panel and everyone in the chat as well, because it's one where, um, you know, we can probably spend um, show after show after show on it. And that's um, or the different auction houses and the strategies of a seller uh, when it comes to picking and choosing what auction house to go with. And what are some of the things to think about associated with the auction house? Now, um, I've kind of narrowed it down to four main ones um, that I, I bring up in the chat, and that's not to dismiss any of the other ones out there. It's just the ones that I've had the most exposure with. But if any of you guys, of course, on the panel um, have a lot more exposure with something else out there, you know, feel free to bring it up. Uh, but it's mostly, you know, of course, HA, Comic League, Comic Connect, and eBay. So what I really wanted to do is uh, I would like to start with uh, with the panel on eBay because um, I think the last show, Bill, you touched on it a little bit on have you seen the uh, the amount of art or the type of art shift considerably on eBay over the last two years. And, uh, you know, when you were talking about it, I was like, man, that fits perfect into this topic. So from my experience, um, you know, about two years ago, maybe a little two years plus, you can find some really decent art on eBay. Now there's a it's typical eBay junk too, right? And dregs all over the place. But, you know, it wasn't uncommon to find, you know, covers, to find interiors or stuff that, um, you know, a lot of people felt was good quality or important. Um, nowadays, if you do eBay search for original art, you know, set your price at like minimum $200, you get a whole lot of kind of random pages, interior pages, but on occasion, when someone does post an auction of something of quality, it just feels like they get a lot of attention and they get a lot of eyeballs. And they actually, I've seen eBay auctions on those good quality pieces set at auction that catch people by surprise actually explode in price. So, you know, open it up to you guys. What have you seen um, on eBay? And if you're a seller looking to sell your original art, um, what would you consider putting on eBay if you would at all? Um, or what are some of the challenges that you guys seen? So I guess we'll go around the room and uh, start with Mikael. Um, it's an easy one for me in that I, I, I was just, uh, we were chatting recently about how eBay is the forum that I'm newest to of, of most of the uh, auction houses. I, even though my very first OA purchase was on eBay, um, I never really looked at it um, comprehensively, and I, it's certain, I was certainly many years after the the gold rush heyday of eBay when you know people in the when it started and people started posting OA you know ten fifteen twenty years ago. So I, I've always felt that there's no um, for the big ticket items there's no value to be had per se. Everybody knows it's there and it's going to go to the person who wants it the most. Um, but that being said, in recent days, I have been looking more. I've got a few buyers that I have on my watch list, 
and it's starting to yield interesting pieces. Coincidentally, the uh, and I buy very little from eBay, but uh, my most recent uh, post is from eBay, and it was a piece that was listed uh, for a price that I thought was very high. But so I've been watching it for weeks or even a couple of months, and then I got that email saying, you know, it's if you pay sixty, you know, forty percent off, you can buy it now. And uh, I just I felt at that point the value came close to where I was happy with it. I just picked it up and. It's a piece I'm super happy with. Uh, so that's my experience. I don't sell though. I'd be very curious to hear about you know the selling side of it if you guys have experience. Ruben, you've been selling for a long, long time. Uh, how has eBay uh, been incorporated into your selling strategies, or do you consider it at all? Um, it's not. I hate eBay. I haven't used it in 15 years or so. <laughs> um, oh. Honestly, um, I, I'll be honest. Um, as a, are you? Oh, as a seller specifically only, you're, you're, you're talking about um, James. Open up, man. You tell okay. me. Uh, so I, I want to say that as a seller, to specify that, um, definitely don't remember the last time I sold. So maybe 15 years. You know, maybe once or twice within those 15 years. I, I don't know. Um, I never liked it. I never did well with it. Um, to me, in my uh, experience as a seller, the only times I ever did well was if I put something vintage. So either from the 60s, 70s, let's say even 80s. Um, and this would have been going back already close to 20 years, I want to say. Um, and the thing was that I already had my website for, for a few years by that point. And so even though those types of pieces did well for me on eBay, I just as easily could sell them on the website, right? So I, I typically wouldn't put that kind of stuff on, on, on eBay. And I would use eBay in those days um, to sell once per year uh, towards the end of the year, like November, December. I'd want to clear out, you know, old stock that hadn't moved uh, for a long time. And um, so then I, I put a slew of auctions um, in the fall and just to get rid of it. And... Ultimately, most of the time, I would lose a little bit of money or, you know, basically like break even. And, you know, if you made a little bit, it was not even anything to sort of write home about. Um, so, yeah, so I've never been a fan. Um, and and as, a, as a buyer, I can only say that I don't, I also don't go to eBay ever, except mm -hmm. on the rare occasion when I'm on, I'm on um, CAF already. And I happened to catch one of the CAF uh, eBay adverts at the top, uh, or is it at the bottom? Top and bottom? Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, so then something interests me there, of course, and then I look through those, and I'll click and go just for those specific advertised uh, uh, um, uh, auctions. But otherwise, no, I, I, I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't like it. Don't do it. No, I th I, I'm sure you guys are on it as well, but if... if um... You know, the audience doesn't know. I mean, there's a newsletter that goes out, or, or I forgot the gentleman who posts it, but Comic Art Tips or something like that, where he yeah. consolidates all the eBay auctions that are, he, you know, feels significant. And usually he's right on the money. And then also kind of documents, um, you know, the eBay sales from the previous week. And that comes out every week. And uh, it's good and bad uh, because it makes me aware of a lot of eBay auctions or eBay pieces that I have no idea about. But it also makes everybody aware of all the ebay auctions and ebay pieces that we have no idea about and so nothing gets yeah ebay by. ebay was a ebay used to be used to be a potential gold mine because people would post things and post them incorrectly so yeah. they would put it under it's it's a like a comic book store would get inventory in and then they'd get a piece of art and and so their default was always comic books or comic magazines and every once in a while, I mean, Robert Frey tells the story about how he's gotten some amazing Perez pieces over the years because the seller listed it wrong. And even if you have watches under the, the artwork, you don't you, you, you didn't always find those. And so suddenly you'd have this amazing, you know, wraparound cover that was five hundred dollars um, when the going rate would have been in the thousands. And uh, yeah, the in the heyday, eBay was great now. For me, eBay is pretty much like like social media. It's a giant time suck. Um, <laughs> you, you you've got to go. Th you, you see the same listings over and over and over and over and over again. 
and uh, you know it, it, every once in a while there's something really interesting um but most of the time it's just i've seen that i've seen that i've read about that i've seen that um and, and as a seller i i i feel that uh the, the current buyers um are are smarter and are heading towards some of the other services you're about to talk about here. Yeah, and a couple things. I think it's at Francisco at comicart.tips um, if you guys want to get on the newsletter, but I absolutely agree. That sounds that. right. Mm -hmm. But one thing, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, versus all the other auction houses that uh, eBay does have going for it, once that auction ends, you get paid pretty quickly. So if uh, you need to uh, get that money quick in your PayPal account, I, I think that's probably the only really advantage is holding at this point. Um, and uh, so, I, I, another point I wanted to quickly make about uh, eBay for any newer collectors, uh, which I ran into recently, was that you have to be a little bit established for eBay to let you bid beyond certain amounts. So when Jim Lee started posting the, uh, the COVID pieces on eBay, uh, to bid on those, I was often running into walls because that was really the first time I ever started bidding on eBay. So um, in the subsequent year, I've made more purchases and made less reviews and whatnot and kind of built up to the point where now it will let me bid whatever I want. But in the early days of last year, I could not bid um, as much as I wanted to consecutively because I was a newbie on eBay. So mm -hmm. if you are interested in eBay, build up a reputation and buy some small pieces and leave feedback so you get into the system. Yeah, it also goes without saying, um, the most instances of possible fraud and deception are on eBay. Um, not small instances, unfortunately. Um, so you have to do your due diligence. Um, you know, we've said it on numerous, numerous shows. Develop a, a network of people you trust, and if you think a piece, um, you know, isn't up to spec, you can ask your network. Post it on Facebook. You see those things all the time on those comic art groups. Like, do you guys think this is valid? And you usually get some pretty honest feedback on that. Um, I guess for the, for the other three, I'm, I'm going to do something a little different in the essence of time. Um, so I'm going to kind of give you my perceptions uh, from my personal um, selling and, and, and buying and comic art of, of the last three. And then, of course, open it up to you guys on, on your perceptions. Um, so when I typically look uh, at an auction house like HA, I usually see that as you're maximizing your value on older or more valuable art. Typically, you know, uh, HA um, gets the highest prices for those prize pieces. Um, it also has that live auction uh, functionality. So a lot of people get cut up, you know, caught up in the competitive nature of the live auctions. And I think that drives a little bit of that, um, you know, pricing that you see. But I've always seen HA as the highest when it comes to fees. Um, so if you've got a piece that um, you're looking to, you know, you don't know if it's going to hit that market value, you don't know how that auction is going to be, um, you have to absolutely calculate the associated fees associated with HA just to make sure that you're getting your maximum return of investment. So that's kind of uh, how I see HA. I'll knock through the other two real quick. Comic Link is I've typically seen that as an uh, awesome form for more modern art. Um, you know, stuff that, uh, you know, typically hit, you know, there's a lot of Silver Age, there's a lot of stuff on there, but if you have a modern art piece that you feel is valuable that you're looking to put to auction, I usually, uh, my go-to associated with that is Comic Link. Um, the other thing is because of the nature of the way they do their auctions where you know, there's a, a set countdown. All those people that are familiar with eBay and how eBay works are, are right at home on Comic Link. Um, they know at a certain time limit, you know, you, you know, do your bidding uh, close to the last second, not to jump on any other topics, but, you know, there's that strategy associated with it. Um, and the other thing that I see in Comic Link are, are the commission fees are, are standard, right? So you know exactly what the commissions are going to be. You can go in, I, I guess HA does too, but I think there's some negotiation associated with that. But Comic Link has a set price. And then the, the final one, Comic Connect, is the one I'm not as familiar with, but from my impression, um, they're building a lot of exposure. Um, so if you do have a good piece on Comic Connect, it can stand out in the crowd, kind of like where the current eBay market is now. Um, it does have some less eyeballs if you're looking to do some auctions on the C or D level pieces. So just kind of keep that in mind. And the auction structure, um, if you're not used to it, can be a little bit odd at first. And I understand why they're doing it. There's a, it's kind of a combination of that live bid and, and the last second, where as long as there's a bid in, that auction keeps going indefinitely until someone doesn't bid. And that can help maximize your price. Uh, we've seen it uh, on 
quite a few pieces recently. But the other challenge with that is organizational structure. So if you're trying to do a lot of bids, or if you got a lot of, you know, if you're selling a lot of pieces, people can kind of get disorganized on what time limits are going on associated with what pieces. And sometimes that causes a little bit of chaos from the buying perspective. But it, it's an interesting concept. And, you know, for that right piece, and, you know, can you maximize your value? So, you know, that's my thoughts. Um, you can definitely open up to the panel and uh, we can knock all three of them out. Can I just say something real quick? Do it. T. Gleason, I see you. And my whole topic tonight is about guys like you. So pay attention. <laughs> I'm coming for you, baby. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, I actually found something. I Just to go back to eBay, I, I had that issue where I thought what I was getting might have been a print after I had bought it. And uh, I even contacted the seller immediately because I just thought, oh, my gosh, I just made a mistake. It was a sketch. But as it turned out, I looked around and I found copies of this sketch out there. It was a vintage like Carrie Gamble justice machine piece. And I contacted them and I'm like, I can't, you know, I'm a little concerned. I saw three other ones of this that look similar, but yours looks real. You know, and they're like, I promise you it's real. I don't I get this all the time. No one will buy this damn thing. Because, you know, there are copies out there that, that like Gamble had made in the past. And I, so I'm like, all right, fine. It was $120 or something like that. I'm like, I'll take it. And if I have to return it, I will. And it turned out to be legit. But that just shows you that because eBay is, is such a mess with, uh, you know, the fact that there are people that make, you know, there's production artwork out there. And in this case, there were actually prints of this original, what looks like a convention sketch, uh, you know, on eBay. You can get really confusing. I mean, and I, I felt stupid. I'm like... Here I'm promote I promote calf you know eBay auctions all the time and I felt like I got suckered into into a, the trap that so many other people that are you know new to the hobby happen to and here I am you know 25 year veteran but fortunately I I did work that out and got something nice at the end of the day um, but that's something that I think a lot of people always have to be wary of because it could have easily just been a print yeah they, they fear you, the you think it's uh it's psychological when you consider the 20% that Heritage puts on versus, you know, Comic Link, you know, or where it's, where there's, you know, much less juice. Uh, possible, I guess. What you do know, you mean from a psychological aspect? My apologies, Bill. Like, like, you know, when, when, when I'm looking at, when I look at Comic Link and I see the price, the final price that I'm going to bid, that's basically what I'm going to pay. You know, there's tax and shipping, but you're not adding on 20%. Where, but whereas with Heritage, when you get, especially when you get up into those bigger numbers, um, I feel like there's always a psychological barrier. But even though you know that the price and you're adding it on at the moment, you know, putting in a bid of a thousand dollars doesn't mean a thousand dollars and two fifty. It means you know, twelve fifty. Yeah, yeah, and it's always hard. It's always hard trying to decide in terms of when you're evaluating things. Um, you know, there will be dealers, there will be individuals who say, oh, look, this piece sold for X on Heritage. And, okay, well, what's the real value of that piece? Is the value 1000 or is the value $1,200? Um, you know, and, and you can argue both sides, whereas off of Comic Link, like you say, there's one price. There, there was only the final, the final price, and that's it. Right. Um, so, so that's certainly easier to use for, for comps. Um, I mean, as the buyer, though, psychologically, as a the spreadsheet, you put in the, the juice price. I mean, that's what you pay for it. Right. And I can tell you, I was going to say, I, I factor that in when I'm when I'm budgeting. Right. Yeah. Well, and, it, and that's what the, at the end of the day, that's what you spent. So to me, that's and I, I right. heard many people say right. the same thing. That's the price. The juice, the juice counts as part of the price. It's not like it's a gratuity add on it. That's what you're spent, willing to spend. So when you think of value or you want to, like, look for comps, it's a part of that. It's a part of the final price for that item. Yeah, exactly, Mister Mister Easy Go Lucky. I I saw him mention before. Oh, at least eBay doesn't have the 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 high buyer premiums. And I just wanted to say, shit, that that's a great topic for me for next week because <laughs> Mister Easy Go Lucky. Just so you know, the buyer's premiums. I'm I'm assuming you're referring to Heritage. Don't affect the buyer. They only directly affect. The seller. I'm sure that's a surprise to you to hear that, but maybe I'll talk about it next week. That's factored into the price for 99% of bidders. So that's mm. another topic for another day, though. Mm. Yeah. Well, one. You know. I mean. I'm sure most of the people watching, of course, have bought off off the auction houses. But it kind of goes without saying. 
you know, you got your final price, you've got your, your, your buyer's premium and everything along those lines. But when you do get that bill, just know you got taxes, you got shipping and handling, you've got a bunch of other fees that, you know, uh, there are a couple of buddies of mine have bought some, you know, made huge investments on some of the auctions recently. And, and uh, those taxes, you know, you know, they're coming, but uh, you know, that bill still sneaks up on you. Um, and then one other aspect, um, you know, if, if you are putting some decent pieces on there, just know most of those auction houses will do some type of upfront payment for you. So I mentioned eBay is like instant pay. Yeah, actually, you can probably, you know, depending on the piece, depending on your reputation with that auction house, you have the opportunity to basically do a zero uh, percent interest loan up front um, on the pieces that you're putting at auction. And just make sure you look at that value and be very, very conservative because you don't want to call it having no money. Um, but you know, I've done it a couple times. Um, you know, got the pay forward, and, and it's worked out real well. Yeah, most of, that's an incentive that most of the auction houses will offer now is is an advance on what you're giving them. You know, just as a a tease to you know get the art. You know, everybody, it's all about it's all about the you know the, it's great to have the buyers, but you don't have buyers if you don't have great art. So all the auction houses are really bending over backwards to do what they can to to get your art in their. Uh, in their auctions, and, and I know a few other people mentioned Hakes as well. Hakes is always an option. They, I think, they only do auctions three times a year, where, where comic art would be a part of it. But um, uh, I don't have any experience with them outside of talking with them about their, uh, you know, their practices and and the stuff that I do with them for, from a PR standpoint on CAF. But um, I, as far as I've seen, they've done a, a really good job, and they they just are a different mix. They're they're they have so many other collectibles being auctioned at the same time that it, it, hopefully that exposes different people to the original art that's in there that we're normally be looking for it and going for it. But it's also a drawback because they have so many other things to look at while you're there. But you know, another, another outfit that you, people could explore as far as uh, looking at auction houses. Yeah. With that, uh, with the past year and a half, and I, um, you know, with uh, you know, COVID pandemic being what it is and no cons, um, the art shifting from eBay, haven't you guys seen just the auction houses, the attention that they're getting, the prices that they're seeing, um, the conversations that are happening around it have absolutely exploded. So I'm, I'm actually curious on that, if that momentum continues, like if they built in that audience, or if you're going to see some drop off once uh, the convention scene starts popping up again. Uh, I was going to say, my opinion is that now that they've got the momentum, they're not going to let it go. You know, they're the, the, the people with the art to sell now see that you know, if you put it in a comic link or a heritage auction that you're going to probably exceed what your expectations are on quality artworks. And so I don't see that really letting up. I don't see how a con is going to change some, you know, it's going to change that or dilute what the auction houses are getting. It's certainly diluting what well, you're getting, you know, over time, but. Sure. I might disagree slightly, Bill, but okay. only to the extent that, only to the extent that I think you have a lot of dealers that in the last year were putting pieces into heritage where they would normally just have it up on their walls in Chicago and New York and out in San Diego, et cetera. So you might see some of that stuff disappearing. That's very true. And I, and I, I, now that you say that, I would add that, you know, dealers have been very aggressive bidders and buyers in these auctions as well, because they don't have conventions where they're re replenishing their inventories. So that's, that's added a, a whole new, I mean, they were always there, but now they really don't have the cons to have the collectors come up and buy directly from them. So they're they're probably, I mean, at least from my you know conversations, you know, they're a little more aggressive than they might have been before COVID happened. So so that that could have been part of the reason we're seeing the the increase in prices too, because you're getting more uh, dealer competition than than it's it's not just collectors out there buying and bidding on these things like like we all think it is. Like that, they can always buy off dueling dealers, right? <laughs> <laughs> not if they're on the show though. But, um, um, but yeah, <laughs> one last thing I was going to say um, uh, off on the topic um, it's something I didn't know um, because I haven't done enough sales uh, at HA. But you know, again, if you build a reputation or if you have art that's large enough, uh, apparently the seller fees are negotiable. And then if it's absolutely large enough, um, you, there is, I think, a certain commission associated with buyer's premium. So I'll ask, you know, Michael, I don't know if you know that because uh, you're, you're pretty. Uh, big when it comes to the auction side, but you know, that's what I've heard from a, a couple of acquaintances. So I just want to see if that was true. 
can confirm. <laughs> yeah, no, if you have, if, if, uh, and, and this was something I was taught by, by someone else. It's not, it, it's not something I would have uh, thought of. I, I knew you could get rid of the seller's premium if, uh, with, without any kind of uh, effort. You could either have it reduced or eliminated entirely, which, uh, which is great. And it used to kill me that they would have um, fees if you didn't hit reserve. So you learn to put stuff in without reserve as, as long as you're comfortable with, with the piece doing well enough. Um, but yeah, it, 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 as long as you as long as you have the right stuff uh, to work with, then uh, it's like everyone else. <laughs> Everything's negotiable. It's the other golden rule. Who has the gold makes the rules. <laughs> exactly. So I'm good, Bill. Anything else? Uh, anyone else on the panel want to adjust on the topic or move on to smart? Can I just ask you guys, um, all of you guys being American, do you know um, roughly how many states now? um get get these sales tax applied like when you when you make purchases online and, and you got to get mail order i'm not sure oh but it's not it's not the it's not, the, the rule right ruben the the rule used to be the rule used to be that uh the, the what if if the business has a if the company has a place of business in that state right. uh, then they certainly had to but but I think there were some, some congressional changes uh, a couple years ago in the tax codes. And, and I think that almost every state that has a sales tax, um, most, most of these major businesses that are doing interstate sales um, ha have, to, have to honor all or most of those. There are some states still like Delaware and um, right. oh, where else is there no sales tax? There are a couple that have no sales tax. That, so you don't have to worry about that. But uh, all I know is here in California, everyone takes their tax. <laughs> yeah, whether, right. it's, whether it's eBay. Or, right or, now, being on YouTube. He's I, I'm, I'm, I, came, I came at that from the perspective that, you know, I was thinking about Heritage when they started charging sales tax uh, or having to collect it, if you will. And um, early on, if I remember correctly, the way they did it was, well, if we have an office in that state, then we got to collect tax and charge you tax. But over the last few years, it seems like every time I speak to somebody in a different state, they're like, oh, yeah, I got charged tax from, from Heritage. I, me too, me too, me too. I, so it's, it's, it's getting to the point where, wow, is there no states left other than Delaware where they, you know, Heritage doesn't collect tax for? It just seems like it's more and more and it's more widespread, you know? So I'm just curious. That's all. They mentioned in the uh, chat a few states that still don't have sales oh, tax. Oh, there you go. Yeah, okay. Wow, that's not a lot. Not, no, not many. And, and I'll answer one question before we switch over to the art. Michael Finn said he didn't, had never heard of anyone getting a buyer's uh, fee discount. And that's not what we were saying. We were, we were saying that the seller of the artwork can negotiate to get a portion of the buyer's premium if they are the right type of seller. And I don't know what kind of seller that is, but that is what we were talking about. Buyers can't get a discount for themselves. They're still going to pay the, you know, their premium, but, um, but that's what we were talking about. I like that, Tia. Tatiana's comment. I love that. In, that in California, they are one step. <laughs> just walking in. Yeah, there you go. I'm sure that's probably true. Don't give them any ideas. Well, Cal California, I and someone else kind of talked about, the, or in the comments, I think, mentioned it. And that is, you owe the sales tax whether it's collected or not. And, and there are instances, if, there's, if it's a big enough purchase and it wasn't reported, you have to be careful that California doesn't find out about it because they will come after you for the sales tax you were supposed to have paid and didn't. Well, I know Mikel just moved to California. So he's looking around going, oh, man, i got to learn these rules. <laughs> well, I moved, I, I moved from Massachusetts, you, so uh, it's all good. Um, but also it's worth mentioning well, that, that means uh, even on eBay, um, or sorry, with PayPal now, um, you know, if you're getting large influxes of cash in because you did a private deal or something, that's still a purchase and a sale. Like if you sold something and money came into your eBay account and then that's going on, you know, onto the government, like it's in your best interest to start just reporting that um, in whatever way works best for your taxes. But eventually it's, it's getting tighter and tighter. The, uh, I won't say noose, but uh, the rope of responsibility. <laughs> Check out what well, it just incentivizes all of us to become to become dealers, so we can get uh, tax yeah, waiver. Yeah, basically. Check out check out what Chris says. That's crazy, right? Like 
We had an LCS get shut down for not collecting sales tax. I mean, what was the LCS thinking? Honestly, you know, that's mm -hmm. wow. So if I'm an amateur dueling dealers, I can apply for a tax certificate. That's an incentive bill. <laughs> it's not I amateur so. dueling dealers, it's ADD. ADD. Oh, ADD. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, see, we could talk about this much longer, but we probably should move on and look at some artwork and then move on to the next topic. And, uh, and Michael, I believe you're going to go first tonight on the, uh, for the show and tell. So let's get the first yes, piece indeed. on the screen. Here we go. Ooh. Well, so I, I've always been a fan of of Craig Hamilton's work, uh, just in general, from from his uh, Aquaman days uh, onward. But um, when I saw this piece, it just completely blew me away. And and I have to confess that uh, through uh, Craig's at least former, I don't know if he's his, one of his art dealers, if if uh, or past art dealers. Uh, Spencer Beck uh, had a lot of uh, the preliminaries from this, and I was actually able to score some of the uh, pencil on vellum preliminaries that he had done. But when when I was a, a kid collecting comics, uh, there were two areas that that I loved more than anything. That was magic and and the cosmic stuff. And th this was just the most incredible cosmic stuff uh, piece I'd ever seen as, as a commission. So blew me away and I, was, I really wanted to highlight it because it was just so gorgeous and Craig just uh, just knocked it out of the park on this. That's fantastic. Um, that's, is that, that's a commission? Yeah. That's okay. And I love, I love Craig's pencils. So this is amazing. Michael, how long did you have to wait for this one? Oh, that's not mine. This I forget whose gallery this oh, is out right, of. Um, right. You're confusing somebody else. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, I it's, I um, wish it were mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. Oh, my God, it looks like it. It looks like it. it would yeah, be no. one of those pieces that would have been perfect for like a back in the '80s, a nice uh, poster. You know, Marvel poster. It looks perfect for that. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And it's funny you say that because that's a good segue into the second piece. Oh, cool. <laughs> yep, and here that one is. Oh, my God. So, as Ruben was saying, back in the 80s, uh, and I think it was around 83, 84 or so, um, DC started putting out some of these amazing uh, posters. First, The first one they did was the New Teen Titans, and I'm thrilled to own the, the painting for that one. But... The second, I think this was the second one. It was the Legion of Superheroes done by the team at the time, which was, which was uh, Keith Giffen and uh, Larry Mostead. And this thing is just, you know, <laughs> I like big art, and I cannot lie. Um, <laughs> but I also love, I also love superhero throw up, as some people used to call it, when you just have like every character you can even imagine. And and here it was, and DC, you know, put it together and. It's one of those pieces where you just have to go in there and go, all right, can I identify everyone who's in here? Where Where is this character or that character? Um, and it's just gorgeous. And uh, so it, it reminded me of my of, of my college years because this was a, a poster that I did own and I did have uh, hanging on my wall. And so uh, when we were when we were putting together our, our list for tonight, I was like, oh, let's let's. Uh, Let's highlight this one because just it brings back good feels. And, and, is, 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 this is only a three-part piece. I, I thought it was a four-parter. Uh, it is a four-part. Yeah, yeah that's four. four. Yeah. Wow! Holy! Bill shit. was just trying to. Uh, I was trying to zoom, zoom in, in a little bit to get yeah, a little yeah. more detail. Got you. Wow! You you gotta wonder this. You gotta wonder if this possibly or very highly potentially uh, holds the record for you know. The most characters in a single image, perhaps even more than no. Nope. Nope. That nope. would be the cover. That would be the cover to Crisis on Infinite Earths. Wow, the so hardcover. Wow, even more than this. Yeah, when when they did the hardcover, it, the the original was uh, the size of a door. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that, that 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 that's what that's what George penciled, and it. it it supposedly is literally every character in the DC universe. Wow. 
Yeah. Either way, it's insanity for sure. This is a close second. If if if, <laughs> if it's not number one, it's the close second. Oh, I can imagine. Wow. And Dino made a comment about Waldo, and I was thinking the exact same thing. It was Waldo. <laughs> character fine with this thing. That's fantastic. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> That's amazing. Hey, can we can we name the the um the owner of the piece just to give him a little props? I don't. I haven't heard it. Yeah, we should. This was in the collection of Aiden Lacey, and the and the prior oh. artwork uh, was oh. in the collection of someone named Laughing Buddha. Oh, Laughing Buddha! <laughs> I've seen that one before, and I always yes. laugh, but I don't know who it is. <laughs> yeah, he's got, a, he's got a number of pretty awesome colored pieces. Uh, yeah, definitely. And I and I should add too that we always link the artworks that we feature here in the description over at YouTube. So if you want to check these artworks as well as well, and you're over at YouTube, just go down to the description and you click the links, and you can check them out while we're, we're showing them on screen. All right, and uh, Ruben, you get to take us on the second topic. Come on, okay. Well, I was I was uh, mentioning before uh, T. Gleason. Hopefully, you're still there. I don't see you right now, but um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, sniping. The uh, de facto title of the uh, chat is uh, sniping. Twenty six years on. Um, Twenty six years being, you know, from the advent of eBay in '95. That's where I guess most people sort of started hearing the. The term sniping, started sniping, sniped without even realizing there was a term for sniping, and onward and onward. Um, but uh, I primarily wanted to reach out uh, to the people, hopefully in the chat, like T, um, who are on the side of anti-sniping. You know, you, you said yourself, T, you, you hate the guys who, who snipe you on eBay. Um, and so for all of hey, you... Hey, Ruben, uh, sorry for interrupting. Why don't we define uh, what sniping is just so we yeah. all start off on the same foot? Yeah, yeah. So basically the, the uh, easy way to put it is um, so any auction platform that is set to end at a very specific time um, and the auction ends once the clock counts down to zero um, and those... Those auction formats, there are people who do not enter their bid until the very last few seconds, last second, um, what have you. Um, and those people, myself included, uh, and I've done it since day one without anybody telling me that it was the thing to do. It just seemed obvious to me that that would be the smart thing to do for bidders who want to hopefully pay less for their auction wins than they have to. Um, and the idea is, of course, people have to understand. So the auction process is set up so that they try to get m as much money for the sellers as possible, but it is incumbent upon the bidders to do whatever they can in their power to pay as little as possible when they win an auction. And so therefore, the theory, of course, is that when you guys are waiting until the last moment and you only put in your one bid, what you're doing effectively is you, it's like playing cards. And I don't need, I'm not a card player, but if you've heard the expression, those of you, I guess, who know how to play cards, uh, not showing your hand, not wanting to show your hand. Even as a kid, I did play, you know, childish kid games and you, everybody was like this, right? Trying to hide their cards so nobody could see them. Why? Well, because if your opponents see your cards, they know what you have, they can use it against you. So the theory, of course, and it's, it's, I mean, it's a proven theory, is that if you show your cards, you show your hand, in other words, on the auction process, meaning if you bid on the first day, the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, let's say it's eBay, seven day auction, all you're doing is you're getting other people to say, oh, look at that, it's already got a bid, hmm, maybe I'll put a bid, and then they put a bid. And other people who think the same way will continue to do so. Bid, bid, bid. Now, the auction platform owners want that to happen because they figure the more bids are there early, the more action the, the lots get, the more it seems that there is interest and the more the perception is that, oh, there, this is going to be a good one. We should, all, we should all get in on the bidding here, which, of course, results in more bids, more, more higher prices. Um, but ultimately, all... You guys that I'm talking to here in the chat that, that hate snipers, people who bid only at the last second, I want, I want to be clear, first of all. I get riled up when I think about the whole topic just because it's been 26 years and I can't believe it's still, it's still a, a, an issue. 
I want to say I'm on your side, you guys. I'm on your side. I'm a collector like you. You should want to pay as little as possible for the stuff you bid on. All right. So I'm on your side and I'm trying to help you here. I'm not I'm being altruistic about this. I'm not trying to be a oh uh, I can't say that word, but yeah, I'm trying to help. So what I want to say is, and please, for those of you in the chat who are anti-sniping, please rebut. Whatever comments I make, whatever my points are, please give rebuttals so I can re give rebuttals back to you. Um, but what I want to say is, you serve, it serves no purpose for any of you to enter a bid, any bid, until the last final moments of any auction. The reason being, what I explained before, by putting it ahead of time, you're only making people think that there's more interest than there really should be. You're going to create a little bit more of a, you know, people, some other people are going to want to bid. And by the way, I know a lot of you um, who like to bid early for whatever reason, and I'd like to know the reason, so please in the chat, tell me, because I, I can't think of a single one why you think that that would be a good idea. But putting the bid in early, you're only encouraging other bidders to put bids early as well. So you're shooting yourselves in the foot. Now, I hear a lot of comments of, you know, 26 years now, I've heard a lot of these comments like, um, oh, you know, I hate, I hate, bit, I hate snipers. Why? Well, I really hate them because I was winning the auction all week long. And then in the last second, I got outbid and I didn't have a chance to, to bid again. All right. So the rebuttal to that is you were never winning the auction. And I know that sounds like crazy concept to hear but that's the fact of the matter is you were never winning that auction you only allowed yourself to believe because you saw your name up in lights as the top bidder supposedly you allowed yourself to believe you were the top bidder for x amount of time what you don't know though what you're not fit you know what you're failing to recognize is that there will always be those bidders who, and the, the, the big difference between the snipers and the non-snipers is that the snipers have always made more of an effort to learn the market values of the items they bid on. And so what, you're, what, what effectively is happening is you allow yourself to believe you were winning when you weren't simply because of the fact that there will always be the snipers who know from day one, the second they see the, the piece of art, that they want to bid on. They know from day one what it's worth to them and what they're willing to pay for it. And they know they're going to come in at the last few moments, which, by the way, is really the true part of the auction. The rest of the seven, whatever, six days and 59, uh, whatever, uh, 40, uh, 20, 23 hours and, and uh, 59 minutes, that's, that's just wasted time. The only thing that matters is that final minute and really the last few seconds. So... You guys who continue to say you got outbid at the last second, you didn't get a second chance, don't forget, the guy who sniped you also doesn't get a second chance, right? It's a level playing field for everybody, whether you decide you're going to bid early or at the last moment or in the middle of the, you know, of the week. It doesn't I'd matter. Like to, sure. Well, yeah. I'll say that just to give you something to, uh, you know, I like your feedback on. So I, I, I do sniping at auctions, absolutely. I mean... Most people do that strategy all the time. You know, I've even used like on um, previous eBay auctions, you know, computer programs, right, to, to knock that bid in the last second. Yeah. But as far as, uh, you know, maybe from a counter argument standpoint, of uh, there's convenience and there's organization. So that's where I see people who possibly won't, won't go the sniping route when, you know, they, they don't have time in the day to invest um, into those auctions, maybe, you know, there's stuff that's coming up during the time where the auction ends. So they'll put their maximum bid in. And if they win, they win, they lose, they lose. Right. And the other thing is from an organizational standpoint, if you, if you're attacking an auction and you're putting in three, four, five, six, seven bids, um, you might just pop them in, uh, put your maximums on there just so, um, you know, you don't have to track it and follow it. So, I mean, I, I get it. If you're, if there's a piece that, you know, you have your heart set on and that's the, you know, to maximize, the value of that piece uh, for those auctions that have that ending time, 
you, you, you got to be there at the last second. Um, but, you know, you, you were looking for anti-sniper. I don't know if anyone's truly anti-sniper that I know. Um, he, maybe he, just all people that don't win. But that's he, where I see the uh, counter-argument. P. Gleason in the comments earlier, he literally used the word, I hate snipers, uh, the snipers who, who beat me on, on, uh, on uh, eBay auctions. So people believe me, there's tons. And by the way, the reason, just so you guys know, the reason I decided to uh, uh, speak on this topic for this week is because a couple of weeks ago, I happened to pop in um, on the uh, original art uh, group on Facebook. And what the first thing I saw, what was it? A huge discussion of guys rambling, just all the negative guys, the negative Nellies. Uh, ah, these snipers, I hate them. Oh, they're sniping me all the time, blah, blah, blah. Anti-sniping, right? It's the same kind of stuff we used to hear back in the 90s, early 2000s, on, on, you know, Comic Art L and all these other message boards and message groups, you know? And it was just, it just freaked me out that like 26 years later, this stuff is like, you still don't get it. I just keep thinking like, you guys still don't get it. I, I, I and I don't, I don't get that, you know? Um, uh, to your point though, James, about the people um, who, who bid early for those reasons that you mentioned, I realize that, right? There's people who do that. However, uh, I will say that I, I firmly believe that those are exceptions to the rule. Um, it's very few and far between the people who will bid early because let's say, you know, they, they can't be around, uh, when the auction ends, uh, bid and then leave and not look at the auction. And, and typically those types of bidders will rarely be the winners in the end, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, it, 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 with sniping programs, which I, by the way, never used ever, 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 I just feel like. If I'm going to lose it, I want to lose it by human error. You know, my, my own loss. I don't want to take a risk of the, the technology failing me. Um, but uh, but for the most part, on the whole, it's just shocking to me. Shocking. Astonishing that in this day and age, 2021, there's still a bunch of people who don't get the reason behind only putting in one bid at the last moment. And it's even doubly shocking that a lot of those people I saw complaining are long time guys I recognize from back in the day, 20 years ago and, and longer. And to not get it after this much time, it's, it's astonishing. So again, it's, it's like I was telling you guys uh, uh, in email privately, I wish we could talk, there's, there's not, just not enough time. I, I, this, this could go on for two hours, but I would hope somebody, where, what, what happened to T? By, T, where are you, man? I haven't seen He's him pop in again. Is he there? Yeah, no, he's, he's been commentating. Oh, okay, yeah, I, just, I haven't been able to, to focus on the chat. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, and Sean makes a, you know, I'll tell you, cause for, from my perspective, I, I don't like to sit around at the last minute, and I've never taken the time to purchase or pay for a sniping program. So I typically will throw, if I actually see something I want to bid on, I'll usually throw a thrill bid on it thinking that I'll get a reminder, and, and then I may bid on it again later, you know, just talking about eBay in general. But so I don't think, I think people don't, they don't hate the snipers as much as they hate the sniping programs, the things that make it easier for the other guy who's willing to take the time out. But I, I did like this comment from Sean Clancy. It's a huge one, so it's going to cover uh, Michael and I, where he's like, if everyone waited till the last second to make a bid, all you're encouraging is somebody to go in and make an offer for that seller to get, get the darn thing removed, too. So it's a double-edged sword because that happens all the time, too. I can't tell you how many times I know Tim Townsend got – great pieces of art off eBay because everybody was sitting around waiting for a piece to, to get to the point where it would be closer to the end of an auction. And he just went in and made an offer and got the piece. And so, I mean, everybody does it. I mean, I've never done it, but I mean, you hear about that kind of thing all the time. So the, yeah. if, if everybody was a sniper, every, more often than not, I bet you, you know, you'd find 30% of the auctions all closing early. And so the, the, the whole, um, the ecosystem of bidding needs people who are the you know who are going to throw that bid out early, and the people who are going to win it at the end because oh, other you, yeah you, it, it's it's just how it is. I get what you're saying though. It's like why do people still complain about it? Well, yeah, I, well, I don't know. It's just that's he, everybody he, tells them to complain about. Humans, <laughs> I wonder. Yeah, yeah. Why do people complain about the rain? Because it happens. Yeah, yeah. And, and because they want to complain about something. Well, human human psychology dictates that there will always be people putting their bids forever and ever early. So that I, I don't expect that, you know, to ever get to the point where, Hey, everybody's a sniper. Of course not. Right. But, um, to la was it Larry who made that last comment? Was that Which one? 
Oh, the long, one, the long oh, no, that was that was Sean Clancy. Oh, Sean Clancy. So, yeah. so to Sean's point, um, I get it, and and I guess there's there's validity to that point. However, I want to point out too that that is only a valid point because obviously you're you're referring to eBay, right? Where the, the auctions are controlled by the you know each individual who put up the the auction uh, uh, item. But uh, if you look at it in terms of uh, the other platform, which works the same way and, and ends at the, that predetermined time, which is Comic Link, um, you know, they're, they're not going to obviously stop those auctions, right? Um, and so with Comic Link, believe me, there's still people, you know, saying the same thing. Ooh, whatever, you, you, you beat me at the last second. I hate those guys. And they just, they don't, they don't understand. And, 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 and again, don't forget, like you, you guys mentioned before that, um, Oh, you know, not everybody has the time to, to, to sort of sit around till the end. I get that. But remember, the, the, the people that I'm really sort of aiming this at are the people who, who complain the most vocally. And those people are the people who enter the bids early and they do stick around and keep checking the auction all week long, all the way to the end. That's how they know and can claim to people, I was, I was winning all week long until they beat me at the end. Because they keep looking at the auction, right? They're, it's the definition of insanity, you know. Yeah. You do the same thing, expect a different result. So if they keep complaining, then and they don't win, maybe they'll change their behaviors. That's all yeah. I can say. Look, the reality. Um, the, 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 sorry, James. Go ahead. I was just going to say I, I, I'm always curious because of the nature of Comic Link, like Ruben was mentioning, how they have a set auction. You know, and it runs for 30 days. I wonder how much the prices would fluctuate if they made it a week shorter or two weeks shorter, because we all know all the bidding happens at the end for those auctions anyway. Um, so it's just kind of a curiosity thing. If, uh, you know, if it was a two week auction or even a seven day auction, would the Comic League still realize the exact same prices? Or do they need that 30 day exposure? Uh, for me, I actually forget about it uh, once it's been, you know, two or three weeks. That's why that email like Bill was mentioning. Mm -hmm. That's true. What did you want to but say, Ruben? Like Ruben, I think the, the reason that people complain is is just a very human one, and that is, I didn't put in a high enough price and I lost. So who can I blame for that? That's not me. And the answer is, I got outbid. I'm the underbidder. I got outbid by fifty dollars, by twenty five dollars, by a hundred dollars. Uh, if if they hadn't done it at the last minute, I would have had time to put in another bid. All right. Well, it goes back to what you were saying before. Then, if you know it's worth four thousand dollars and it's sitting at fifteen hundred, put in. You don't put in a final bid of eighteen hundred. Right. Right. You, right. You, you can't. You can't then get upset if you get outbid okay. on something that's worth four thousand yeah. dollars. Or yeah. if you yeah. really, 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 really want a piece, then put in as much as your wallet will bear. Yeah. And if you get outbid, you get outbid. But at least you can you can say, ah, oh, he yeah. just wanted it more than me. Yeah, absolutely. The only uh, snipers I complain about is when I'm playing Call of Duty. Everything else is fair game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, and I would say you know like you look at Comic Connect where they extend the bidding if you're bidding you know if you're sniping uh, at the end. I mean that's a whole different scenario where you're where sniping just doesn't really benefit you at all because you know th that auction could drag out until the middle of the night. In a, you know, I've heard I've heard horror stories with with situations like that. So Listen, you know, it's, love, it's really based on the platform. I love Vinny. Oh my God, I despise his platform. Oh, Vinny, man. And and by the way, that that platform that Comic Connect uses, and this is what kills me, is that it was created because of all the complaints they used to hear about sniping. I hate snipers. I hate snipers. And it was like a solution supposedly to, to, to stop sniping, you know, which is crazy. But I participated actually recently for the first time and I almost lost my, I wanted to blow my brains out. I lost my mind the way that thing works. You got the, you got the, you got the first one, right? Counting down to almost zero. And then suddenly a bid comes in and it goes, it resets to three minutes. But well, the see it it's, it's achieving what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to yeah. frustrate the snipers. And so you are frustrated when you bid there. So it's, 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 doing, it's, it's perfect. It's typing you, Ruben. It's typing <laughs> you. But listen, listen you're, 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 you are right, but it's not having the proper effect because what it really did is it frustrated me so much that I left and I will never go back and participate in his auctions again. I'm not even kidding. Never again. 
No, so you only right. like auction houses that you can snipe at, and that's okay. You know, it's perfectly uh, yeah. tailored. Yeah. Perfectly tailored. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, 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 for sure. Or, or even even the ones that you can't, like uh, like Heritage, when you're live, when you're bidding live, you can't snipe, right? You you bid as high you you keep hitting that big red button as much as you can. Right, but the target's still moving a little bit. Well, you know, when it's in a live auction, at least it's not not like Comic Connect, certainly, but right. at least you still have that window where you still have a chance to think about it. It didn't. It's not cut off like it would be at eBay. So, you know, you can snipe there, but at the same time, it. I don't know. I wouldn't say it doesn't doesn't pay to snipe, but um, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I just want to say real, real quick to, to end this, uh, just to, to again focus on on anybody out there, any of you guys in the in the live chat, um, if you guys are like anti sniping, you don't agree with what I said, uh, please try to hit me up at my uh, my calf gallery, Ruben the Collector. Uh, I'd be happy to talk to you about it and uh, hear your thoughts and uh, yeah, try to I'll try to clarify. And I'd love to I'd love to hear you convince me that not sniping is the way to go. Anyways, so yeah, that's it. All right. Well, then we're going to move on to some artwork after that spirited discussion. So, uh, Mikhail, I believe you are going to uh, take us on this one here. So let me pull up the first artwork. Oh, wow. Wow. I, I'm not a, a big uh, Batman on Gargoyle guy. That's just me. But, you know, I what really struck me about this is just a completely unique take on the subject. Um, the artist is a um, relatively newer, younger guy that, you know, I've been watching on Instagram and he posted, you know, process shots of this one. And I was just blown away by the final product. All the choice. Yeah, sorry, Tyler Benz, of course. And uh, I will uh, get the gallery for you in a moment as well. But um, just, you know, a really talented young artist, really bringing a nice, unique vision to his work. Uh, which is something that I uh, really appreciate. And just look at the, um, the detail, the, uh, his technique, the way he applies. Um, first of all, it's his own style, which I really like. You, you get some kind of that uh, fine uh, texture uh, technique that you see with other artists. But I really, I see a bent piece and, uh, you know, it, it's immediately... Uh, apparent to me with this current way that he's working. And I, I just thought it was really worth highlighting and showing off. Uh, he just had his first uh, cover, I think, recently published. And uh, I think it's a beautiful piece. It's gorgeous, man. It's wild. Um, can, is this, um, uh, sorry, because I don't know the, the artist. Is this a, a, a pro artist or somebody just? He's a professional artist. He's a really interesting uh, uh, person. He's got a podcast. He's a child of the '80s, uh, very much like me, and uh, they talk about uh, your child. Yeah, tick marks. Um, they talk about you know all of the things from the '80s that um, influenced them. Uh, Wouldn't it be rad? Is the name of the podcast. Um, so he's in repped by Inky Knuckles, uh, Cam at Inky Knuckles. Okay. Uh, he's doing uh, commissions, and uh, like I said, he's uh, had just had a cover published. Uh, I'm sorry, I forget the name of the title, an indie title, but I think you know we're going to see more of him for sure. I, th oh, cool. I thought we agreed to uh, blacklist Daryl's gallery, even if he had nice pieces. But uh, ah. <laughs> no. it's always an exception. Oh, fair enough. For the good stuff. <laughs> right. So Daryl R. From the gallery of Daryl R. That's right. Uh, right. In the chat, I believe. Oh, there he is. Daryl Reitz. All right. And the next artwork? Oh, um, this is from the uh, collection of Ed M, uh, Planet X, as it's uh, becoming known. And, um, but this used to be in his featured gallery. And the way it stands out when you see those featured pieces is just phenomenal. Like, I, I, these two characters are not anything that I'm into, per se. But this illustration is just phenomenal. It, it has all of that 60s vibe going for it, the design of the costume and uh, the the execution, the color has been applied with restraint. And the artist is um, Ben Oliver, who is a oh, fantastic wow. Um, wow. artist. His digital work is amazing. His uh, traditional work is amazing. He's got a beautiful light touch. He's really great with faces and expressions. Um, he did a whole run, uh, run of covers for the uh, most recent Jimmy Olsen series that were really, really funny and uh, well executed. But uh, this color piece I, always stands out in my mind, and I 
wanted to share it. It's fabulous. And, yeah, and you're right. as a fan of uh, um, Robert McGinnis, uh, you know, and, and his many beautiful uh, fashion, uh, sort of fa fa high fashion haute couture type uh, uh, fashion models that he used on his book covers back in the 50s, 60s and 70s. Uh, yeah, this really, really appeals to me like a lot. And I didn't even recognize it as um, Ben Oliver's work. Wow, it's fabulous. Yeah, no, this this definitely evokes like the British, uh, the Avengers, when you see something like this, something from the 60s. True. and definitely. Just hip and mod and yeah, neat stuff. Right, but it's more than Austin Powers. This is an elevated kind of take on that, right? It's very, very sophisticated. But I just, I just noticed, uh, uh, I mean, this, 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 so this appears to be uh, a high fashion 60s version of, uh, of Amparella and Red Sonia, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. okay. I believe it was a variant cover for Vampirella Red Sonia. Oh, and the, okay, so it was published also. Oh, all right. Oh, that's even more. That's even better. Wow, that's fantastic. Wow. Yeah, amazing. And you said this is Daryl's, right? Daryl Reitz? Uh, um, this is from uh, Ed M. Ed oh, M. I'm sorry. Oh, Ed. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, we'll allow his artwork. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Just pick it on, Daryl. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we're going to move on to our third topic tonight. And I, you know what I'm going to do from now on? We're going to put the whoever's talking is in center stage at the top from now on, as it should be. I, I don't know why I never realized that until just now, but that's what we're going to do. So, so Michael. <laughs> All right. So, Michael, we get you get to take us on to our third discussion today. It's my turn. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> cool. So, so one of the things I wanted to talk about, um, and this came up because of a recent uh, email I got through CAF uh, from someone interested in one of my pieces, and um, it really has to do with those of us who collect the pre-90s, pre-2000 type, uh, type artwork, and, and those things that are unique about that artwork, but which might give people pause. And uh, this is one that I am actually very interested in hearing how other people uh, think about these elements and if it impacts their buying decisions. Uh, but essentially, it's, it's dealing with um, different uh, problems that, or, or well, problems from some people's uh, perspectives with respect to artwork. So the first, the first thing has to do with uh, fading and, and that's one that, that I became acutely aware of uh, many years ago when I was uh, able to buy several pages from Jim Starlin's Death of Captain Marvel book. And in, only to find out that Jim had, uh, instead of using the standard India ink uh, for doing the finishing, used markers. And the markers had started to fade. So it's this fading uh, is the concept. And Bill, I don't know if you have... Uh, if you want to put up the first image, but here's an example of a page I used to own. Uh, I do no longer own this, but a uh, Gil Kane page from Action Comics, uh, where again, you can see you can see certain areas where it's a dark black because it was done in a dark normal India ink uh, for, for inking, but the figures themselves were inked in marker. Uh, a lot of times uh, it was done for speed. Sometimes it was just because other people were doing it, why shouldn't I? Uh, but, but the fading of, of the artwork uh, becomes more and more apparent as the years go on, even if you keep it out of the light. Um, so I don't know, have, have, have any of the others, have, have you guys had some issues with respect to this and, and does it impact it? Because it's a beautiful splash. Look at all the characters on this splash. But, um, you know, is there a hesitation to, to buy when you see this uh, this particular issue? Sure, I, I know you're going to talk about a number of, of potential art challenges, um, and, and what I liked about original art when I was getting into it versus like uh, you know key comic collecting was the condition of the artwork wasn't as much of a determining factor, you know, like between a nine point six and a nine point eight on a CGC scale or something like that. Uh, but that being said, um, when it comes to actual, you know, fading of the artwork, that and physical damage, I think, are, are my biggest two negatives. Uh, mostly because, you know, if you do see some fading, 
you know it's non-reversible and for a lot of instances non-stoppable right so how bad can it typically get in the lifespan of the you know when you own the art so you know if it's a key piece if it's a nostalgic piece if it's a killer deal right i'll just have to consider that um, but of all the, the potential art defects man you know fading is a tough one yeah, and Bill, if you want to put up the next the next image, but you can you guys can keep talking. But yeah, the there other... was recently a very um, uh, there was a McFarlane Hulk splash that was floating around at auction with the leader looking at a bunch of monitors with the Hulk on them, and that piece uh, comes to mind because it had all of the uh, marker was brown, um, and it really I think put me and others off that piece, and I don't think it really realized the kind of price it might have otherwise. So, so this next piece is uh, a cover to the New Teen Titans uh, issue seven, and uh, I don't know about issue one because I've never seen it. It's still in Marv's house, but I know with uh, the first handful of these covers, they were inked and marker. And when I owned this, one of the thoughts that I had was, and this was you know twenty years ago, so George was going strong and um, if anything he was a better inker than he was in the 80s um so this i'm curious about people's feedback on and that i was contemplating going to george and asking him to re-ink it but in yeah. ink instead of marker no uh, how do people feel about that see that's <laughs> i assume that was ruben um and i got that kind of response from a few other collectors so i'm curious what you guys think Man, that's a tough one. I see a Rich uh, Cyril in the chat made kind of the same comment. Not, not People going back and having the original artist re-ink it. Not tough at all. Oh. Oh. I don't know, man. That's tough. I think if I was in that situation, I mean, if I was in the situation um, where I had a fading cover like this, um, I would possibly see if uh, I could get it re-inked via a blue line or maybe a, you know, a copy or transparency and still keep the original as an original and maybe take some steps and precautions um you know to kind of archive it as long as possible but i'm i'm in the school of i'm totally against um any manipulation of the original artwork even by the original artist i mean unless thank it's like you. maybe a signature in the bottom corner or something good god thank you thank you james oh my god <laughs> you're welcome dude well, <laughs> ruin clear, clearly because this. Oh, I I didn't know this is this used to be in my collection. It is no longer. Um, had I had if it was still in my collection, you might be looking at a different image. But yeah. I came to the same conclusion, and that was you really shouldn't touch even with even with the original artists. Thank you involved. Thank, um, thank you to, thank to go back in and retouch it. Yes, thank you. I'd like to say something about that. I'd, I'd like to if. Is it possible that we could see each other though? It's just weird talking from the screen with, with, with no. Yeah, you can go back to both. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Um, man. Oh God, this this could go on again. I'd love to talk about this for two hours. Okay, but obviously we don't have time. I just want to say, oh my God, you. It, it's just re reprehensible to me to think that anybody would ever think of touching it. I, I'm and I'm going to say something really unpopular to a lot of people here, um, but. Yes, you know, because I get a lot of people when, when I've spoken to people about this topic and I've had a lot of them say, you know, kind of like the, the sort of smart, the smart, witty comeback as if I'm going to have nothing to say about it. Right. And like, oh, the gotcha thing. They say, oh, so so what do you want to do? Just let it fade into oblivion. And guess what? My answer is yes. Listen, none of this stuff was ever. We all, look, all of us on the panel certainly know, none of this stuff was meant to be, it was never drawn so that those of us watching and talking today could post these things on our walls. It was production, period, for the end product, which is the comic book, period. So, of course, is it sad if it were to fade away into oblivion forever? Of course it is. But here's the, the, the key for me, that, that why it's, I'm so adamantly opposed to, do, to doing anything. You hear, you hear some people saying, well, you know, but what if we meticulous, well, of course it's going to be meticulous. Like, you're not going to get some, some rando to just do some quick job on it. Of course, if you're going to do it, it would be meticulous, right? And then, oh, but what if we meticulously did it with a, a professional, you know, restoration guy or an, an artist or whatever? That's like, no, 
because guess what you have if you do that? Let's pretend it's a restoration guy, right? Joe Blow is his name. All right, so now Joe Blow goes ahead and meticulously goes over that George Perez cover, right? And then he finishes it. It looks nice and dark, okay? And let's just say he did a good enough job in terms of tracing the line, right? Okay, fine. But what you have now, all you have now in terms of original is the original Marvel, let's say, on that, sorry, DC on that, on that piece. You would have the original DC board. It's the only thing that's original now because, in effect, all the people who say, oh, yeah, but, but you've got to prevent it from, from fading into oblivion, right? Well, guess what? Better that it fades into oblivion on its own over time than you paying money to some nobody who never had anything to do with that, with that piece, right? Okay, but Ruben, but Ruben, to, I was talking about... To obliterate it... Then I was talking about having George do it. No, no, hold on. That's another, that's another thing. I'm still opposed to that, but but the the first one because it's the worst. That's why I want to address the other one, right? When it's when it's either an um, a restorer or an artist, as some people have been doing, an artist, you know, or former artists or whatever. Any anybody who had nothing to do, I mean, that's sacrilege, first of all. And if it's the original artist, it is still sacrilege because they listen over time, as you know, Michael. They do not have they right the same line for, for, for 20 years, five, not even five years. These guys change. They get better as artists. The line changes. The line quality is never the same. So, you know, if, if, if you were to tell me the piece was drawn last year, and, oh, my God, the, the ink was so terrible, it faded 12 months later, okay, go ahead and re-ink it. Who cares? It's only a year later, right? But my God, you're talking early '80s or, or even '90s or 2000s, whatever the case may be. The, the the artist line has changed. It's not. It's just not the same anymore. And you're not actually preserving a lot of these guys who are pro pro you know reinking. They think they're convincing themselves that you're preserving the inks. No, you're not. There is no way on earth, scientifically or otherwise, that ink that's fading can be preserved. It can't be rejuvenated and made dark again right so the only thing that happens is you now have a tracing of an original for example george perez cover by joe blow on an original yeah, board, uh, on an original board. michael's uh kind of original uh intent on bring it up is how does it affect like the perceived value if you're looking buy to sell on the play uh piece or having conversations on that oh, not so much I mean, you know, it's I get uh, you know Ruben uh, the collector OA Ten Commandment, and I, I'm fully on board with it. Thou shalt yeah. not over ink. Um, but as far as when you're considering you know buying and selling a piece, uh, how much does that factor into you know what your offers are, or you know if that piece still holds the same value once you see that painting? Well, and, and that's the danger. That's yeah, the because and and think about it. They, they, this is the only copy of New Teen Titan Seven cover. It's right. the only one. Whether it's fading or not fading, that's it. That's that's the unique. And if you loved that issue, I loved that issue. Right. If you loved that issue and you loved that image, should it impact or or, or not? Uh, and that's a that's a tough call. Right. Well, you mean you mean in terms of value, or you mean you mean? Yeah. Wait, and, I, think and, I think that falls into that personal value consideration that you know Dino mentioned a couple of shows ago. Um, does that affect, you know, well, I mean, market as well, but that personal value um, when you see something fade and know there's a possibility of the continuation of the fading. So, yeah, you know, Sean, it's just a consideration. Sean Clancy, in my opinion, yes, that would that would be unacceptable. When he repainted all his paintings, that was ridiculous. I don't I don't subscribe to this idea that, oh, just because Frazetta is like worship. I don't worship any artists, right? I have my favorites. I have my, I'm a fan of a lot of people's work. I don't worship. I don't put them on pedestals. So big name or not, yes, I'm not a fan that he would ever touch older paintings many years later. And a lot of people are, are you know, of that opinion, but there's both sides, you know, there's, right. there's both well, sides that, to that. Yeah. Argument. Well, like James, this is more of a different topic say, this, than what we want. We're, we're, we're yeah, we want to, yeah. because there's a lot of other things that we want to get to while, yeah. I, in Michael's topic here. And uh, yeah, not just the fading 
of the uh, yeah, inks yeah. and how they were done as well. So, so you want to move on to word balloons, Michael? Yes. Yeah. So this 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 was actually the issue that was raised by the the person who approached me to to buy a page in my collection was, and this isn't the page that he was asking after, but this is just an example. He was he was noting that on the page he was interested in that one of the word balloons was missing. And as a result, he wanted to pay less for it because the word balloon was gone. Um, and uh, now that's, that's fine. I mean, I, I, I don't know how much it would cost to have a word balloon replaced, but I can't imagine it would be very much from some of the resorters out there. But here, this page, uh, this Avengers page is a great example because uh, all of the word balloons were uh, either pasted on or in, in some instances, you just see little bubbles with numbers in the, in the bottom uh, in the bottom couple of panels where word balloons would, uh, and you can see it actually in the, in the close up uh, of, of uh, the right hand side uh, we're, we're on the trash can where there's a number because that's where the word balloon's going to go. Um, for me personally, I, I'm more interested in the art, obviously, but one of the reasons I love collecting 60s, 70s, 80s art is because it does have the text. And comic books for me was that combination, not just the artwork. I'm not a guy who just loves splash pages. I'm a guy who loves the story. And I, in fact, I collect sequential pages because of that. I love following the story from one page to the next. Um, so uh, for, for me, it doesn't matter if the word balloons are there or not. And, uh, and, and you know, that's why I bought this page because it's just a great action page. And the next one, Bill, if you want to show that too, um, this, this uh, giant size FF page um, where, where you can see the browning from where the, uh, the word balloons used to be yeah. and uh, they're, they're, not, they're missing. I don't care. I just, I'm, I'm in it for, uh, yeah, yeah, for, yeah. for the beauty of the page. Yeah. And, and if one or two are, are gone, I can always have a, a, those word balloons reproduce and put onto an overlay or something if I want to. Uh, if, if they're not the originals, but uh, just something for people to keep in mind uh, for, for newer collectors who are looking at some of these older things that this happens. In a lot of instances, these things are, are pasted on and, and word balloons fall off. So um, hopefully, uh, ho hopefully you won't be too upset by it and keep in mind that uh, the, the art is the art and it's still gorgeous and uh, I, I I agree with Larry. I don't think it matters at all. I, <laughs> I, I mean, I think given, um, I mean, and it's an impossibility because of its one-on-one -on -one nature of OA, but given two exact pages, one with word balloons, one without, of course, everyone will gravitate towards the ones with, uh, you know, the completed pro product. But I think that for me, that's a minor, minor deficiency. Um, what I look for when it comes to art, I just bought a, a DPS, a double page, well, shocker, right? Uh, that had a, a word balloon. Or two <laughs> more I would have loved. Granted, I would have. You know, it would have been really, really cool to have it on. But um, you know, it didn't really. You know, affect my overall enjoyment of the piece. And uh, you know, if it, like you mentioned, an overlay is an is an or a transparency is an easy remedy if it you know really gnaws at you. But I think for ultra perfectionists, though, it, it might be a challenge. But I think for most people, it's okay. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to make a, a, just to quickly address something that Dino said. Um, I, I've seen it go both ways where an artist who does layouts incorporating the word balloons and kind of figures out where the text is going on the page and then incorporates the layout around it. Um, you know, that, that, that everything is a part of the storytelling process. Um, so it's, um, you know, you could consider it part of the art, part of the way the page was meant to be. It's nice when they're there, and uh, it's not a big deal for me if they're not, but uh, you know, I wouldn't just uh, just write off the word below. You know, as long as you're not the guy who likes to no. just get a page and start ripping them off proactively, just don't be that guy. <laughs> oh, God. Now, uh, Bill, if you want to show the next one, uh, now this this topic though, this third uh, element is one that does bother me. Oh wait, this is oh, this is a different oh, one. I'm sorry. Nope. It's the. No, uh, that's, okay. that's okay. We'll deal with this and then. Okay. I was looking with the over the, the Titans. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll go to that one. Yes. So, one of the things that happened in the 80s a lot, uh, I don't know if, if it was much in the 70s. I think it started in the 80s with the offset printing and the, and the better print quality uh, 
and they, they finally started uh, being able to do more special effects through the use of overlays. And here you can see um, it's not just coloration. It is, it is a separate series of drawings of Jericho um, that was done on a separate sheet. Uh, and then you can see on the main page there are, there are spots where uh, the overlay is lined up and then placed over so that these uh, overlays were done in a separate color. Uh, and so in, in the final printed work, uh, I don't, I think usually it was red uh, that, that these were sometimes uh, blue, but usually red that, that would be used as an overlay. And when these are missing, it, it bothers me. So uh, if you want to do the next one, Bill, uh, the other Titans. Yeah, so here you can see, for instance, uh, this surprint and, uh, it, and, and it even says on it that it's going to be in blue. This is an important element. The, the piece that's on the surprint, this image of Trigon is, is <laughs> really important to me for that page. If that were missing, that would annoy the crap out of me. And uh, I, I know in Heritage recently, there was a, a, a page from the history of the DC universe and it was a Wonder Woman page. And it was incomplete because it was missing the surprint. And, and I didn't bid on it uh, because of that. Um, and I agree, Mike, they don't display well, and it's, it's uh, because the, the surprint pages themselves have uh, that onion skin, it browns over time and, and makes, it, uh, makes, <laughs> makes it annoying if, if, if you've got them there. Uh, and that's why in some instances I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take out the surprint area and put it onto a clear sheet uh, overlay so uh, it, it fits much, uh, much more nicely. But these things missing, this would bother me. Word balloons, that doesn't bother me. The artwork that's actually missing, that bothers me. Makes sense. And the, uh, the surprints are like one of the nicest parts about some of the uh, artist editions that you get. When they, when they include yeah. them as onion skin and you can kind of see how it was put together. I really enjoy those. Oh yeah, those, those are fantastic with Kale. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the next thing for people to be aware of uh, for, for those newer collectors, um, and uh, Bill showed it before, so we can go back to that, has, has to do with vellum and the use of vellum by, uh, by a number of artists uh, during the 70s and 80s as uh, this, as I said, this kind of this onion skin that you could draw on, uh, the, this, the, the problem being that it's not on the original artboard, it's on this very thin, very flimsy material uh, which, as you'll see in that in that first image, gets taped down to the board, um, uh, and in the case of the Ms. Marvel, it was later mounted on the board, um, and it, it's not as appealing to the eye because it's it's got that yellowing, etc. But it's still art, and it's still beautiful. So people just need to be aware of this. So that when you see this, you're not surprised and say, "Wait, why is this on a, a, this?" This tiny flimsy piece of paper. Uh, where, where's the, the actual artboard? Um, that was it. That that's what they used. Um, as, hey, as Rich Cirillo says, you know, a lot of stuff was done on vellum and later mounted. Yeah. So most of my collection, I think, is after the, the vellum era. Uh, if you know, why was that a medium? Uh, that a medium? Uh, why was that vellum used by a lot of the artists? Was it easier? Was it? I, I mean, I have no idea. I mean, I've heard the term. I've seen artwork with it on. Um, My understanding just, is that you know that some like John Romita Senior, he just liked the tooth that the vellum had. It took the his his method of uh, laying down the inks differently, or the way he liked it, and because it it didn't really detract from the end product, printing a comic, that he chose to to work in that way. And it's I think it was just like I say, the tooth of the page with the way he he laid down the inks, and it just felt better for him. Yep, that's exactly what it is, Bill. Yep. It's, just, it's exactly how it feels as the ink comes off the brush or the pen. Is the huh. um, yellowing on the Miss Marvel cover the adhesive or the vellum itself? Um, it's been so long since I had it, I don't recall. Well, Dino I might be able to have that one now. Do you, uh, you know of any current artists that use that? Jeff uh, Darrow. Vellum? Jeff Darrow works on the vellum. Right, very true. Interesting. And uh, it is, it is uh, in my opinion, I love the look and feel of vellum. And you, know, you could mount a vellum piece with a float mount 
and make it look super cool. It's extremely hard to handle. It takes um, crinkles very easily. It takes uh, marks very easily. It's uh, so, you know, and he, so he has a big piece. And like, I was just like, how do you even transport this uh, back and forth? They're very hard to, uh, in my opinion, the bigger pieces. Now, the other thing that was interesting, because it is sharper, as someone had pointed out, and, uh, and holds the inks better, is a, a lot of times the image is actually smaller than the normal 11 by 17. Uh, so again, these are just these are just things for people to be aware of, for collectors to be aware of, that when you see it, you don't uh, sit there and say, wait, are you sure this is real? Wait, this isn't the, this isn't a cover size illustration. Um, that's that's how a lot of things were done uh, at that time. So, uh, and, and Michael, especially um, for Romita. So, yeah. and you obviously you, you you've had some pieces with Velo in the past. Um, do you think it would detract you from you know future purchases if a piece had Velo, or would just or what kind of? Uh, no, in, in in fact, I still own I still own that Daredevil piece. That's uh, I I have no issue with it, no problem with it personally. I think it should attract you a lot, and I'll make the offer. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, we've seen what the those uh, Ramita Senior dueling dealer pieces have you know sold for. They're rather small, and they're selling for for decent prices. I think at the end of the day, if that's what you got, that's you know what you're going to get, and you know, and you're willing to pay for it still. So, uh, I don't think you know vellum has never been a negative for me. It's just an oddity. And uh, and like people were mentioning earlier about Darrow, his his vellum is a much heavier material, and I, you know I find that odd too because it's just it's so different. It's not something you're used to handling, but uh, you, you know, craft tint is something different that artists work on too. But we don't have a problem with that either, being you know being the final product. So yeah, I don't, vellum has never been something that bothered me. Can I just uh, address um, a comment? Right, so by, um, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say because we're, we're 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 running long, so I don't want to. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, and this is and this is my favorite topic, and oh, that is uh, when pieces have been colored. Hey, uh, I think I think Bill's got uh, a better a better image of this, but um, I personally love this. Now there there are people who hate it, but so these pieces were originally eleven by seventeen black and white art, uh, normal pencil ink. To art uh, that the prior owners prior to me had taken to in these uh, both these instances uh, Steve Olaf uh, to have hand colored. Um, personally, I, I when it's done well, I love this stuff. It uh, it just adds another dimension. It makes it feel more like the comics that uh, that that I had uh, read and and fell in love with. And so I have no issues with it, but I know, and you can see it on some of the um, some of the people who are who are commenting that it's sacrilege, and how dare you do anything to the originals? Um, you know that this is a hot button topic for people too. So uh, I'm curious how you guys feel about it. Like I said, these these are some of my favorite pieces. These these two color pieces. Uh, it does not bother me as long as the color art was done well and preferably done by a professional color you know comic book colorist i have seen some really bad um hey i gave this to my nephew and he started coloring it type jobs um i think there was a i think i, I for some reason i remember it as being an avengers a giant size avengers page that had like vision on it that was like partially colored um that, that had been in auction a couple times and it just looks awful and and for me that's a reason not to buy that one but when you've got someone someone amazing doing a, a an amazing job like this i'm i'm good to go yeah for for me as if the coloring was part of the production process because i guess sometimes i did that and i think it's uh, would be probably a non-issue if it was colored after production i mean i'd have to uh, hesitate on that um, that, that's kind of my feelings, but that being said, I've never bought a color piece, so I'm kind of speaking out of a little ignorance there. It's hard to say. I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, I wouldn't get it done, but I, I you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's still the, the only piece of art that's left, right? So if you really want it, I've, we've seen uh, whether there's a, one of the Avengers Perez covers has uh, been painted by Olaf and again, okay, two, two of them. 
Right. So 98 and 99. 198 and 198. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, uh, that's all there's all that's left. So, you know, I think it might detract from, you know, it, it would deter some people from bidding on or buying those items just because they, they're more purists and they want the, just the ink version of the covers, but what are you going to do? I mean, I think this topic came up recently in, in another chat that I was doing. And, you know, there were sometimes, you know, as a, as a collector, when you own that artwork, some people have the mentality that they own it and they can do whatever they want with it. You know, they don't, they didn't approach, they didn't approach the hobby maybe 20 years ago that they were a caretaker of this work. It was just theirs. And, you know, they could, they could give it to their kid and he could color it in with colored pencils. And I think that over time that, you know, I think today, I think we, we, we view the hobby more as if we really are preserving the art going forward. So I don't think we'd see people doing that today. Like, like we we've seen those pieces done in the past, but, I mean, it doesn't make the artwork any less beautiful at the end of the day. My, you know, for me, I I still like like to see them because I can't. It's the only thing that's out there. But that's my that's my feeling. I don't think you'd I don't think we'd see that happen hardly at all from anybody who's in any way keyed into the hobby through CAF or through these chats that would whatever would ever have that done to the art today. And I bet you a lot of colorists would look at it today and say, No, I'm not going to touch that. You know, it's like, it's like when when I interviewed Scott Williams the other day, and he's like, I would never ink a, a rights in pencil piece. They would just be like, it's I can't do it. It's got to stay the way it is, the way the art, you know, the artist intended it. And I think that most most guys would probably walk away from from doing that something like that he today. He wouldn't even do a, uh, a blue line. He wouldn't even ink a blue right, line. Right. He said, well, yeah. He, well, he wouldn't. Yeah, he wouldn't even do a blue line. But that's uh, yeah, very true. Bill, you, you know, uh, the, uh, one of the big things about these shows that I love the most is the interaction with the with the crowd. I just want to quickly um, read a, a comment uh, five minutes ago or so up uh, by Rom2814. says, uh, got to say, I've been collecting for 20 plus years and I've learned more from these videos than I have in that time. So very good. Well, it's true. It's like getting everybody together to talk about this stuff. And we, sh we should have been doing this uh, at least five years ago. Just imagine where we'd be today. <laughs> Yeah, a, you know, ruling like, the world, Bill. Ruling that, the world. There would be, there would be, there would be less anti-snipers, uh, I think. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna give you your own channel, Ruben. Yeah, I don't <laughs> know. Your own show. <laughs> uh, but this is a great topic, Michael. I, honestly, yeah. I mean, I, there's a lot of things in here that we could dive more into, but but I do think you know conditions oh, yeah. are always a really a, a, an interesting. You know, people have everybody has a different take on on condition issues, whether it's the word balloons or, or things done to the art after the fact. But um, and it's something that we, you know, we especially with that period of art, we're always going to run into that, and it's going to turn some people off. But that's just that's just how it is. I mean, I, I still will go back to it's the only thing, only piece of art for that thing that's out there. So you're going to take it if you love it and pass on it if you can, if you really don't. That's uh, again, I go back to the one of the advantages of original art for me. Like if you have a comic book and. You've got to treat it like it's the holy grail and dust it off every day and the original art you want to take care of it but how many people have seen oh a dealer flop around a piece of art while he's selling it and you're going oh my god but still it has stayed condition every week you get to see that every week uh, every wednesday <laughs> no <laughs> uh, let's see you're, so, you're lucky i'm not eating cake today <laughs> I I held up. Uh, I was over at Mike's house today, and I, I did. I, I found. I actually found something I liked, and I put it in, in the pile. But it was funny. I literally picked it up, and it slipped right out of my hand. And it was wasn't in a mile or anything. It fell straight to the floor. And he's like, "Well, you own it now. <laughs> you broke it. You bought it." <laughs> So uh, of course nothing happened to it, but it scared the heck out of me because I was like, I found one, I really like it, and it, you know, it's like it was like it was a it was a meme moment, you know. So anyway, all right. So uh, James, we're gonna look at the, your two picks for for this uh, show. Awesome. And, uh, well, I'll knock these ones out pretty quick. Um, unlike uh, some of my peers, I, I failed all my art appreciation classes, so I have no technical expertise when talking about lines or shadows. I'm just gonna say. I mean, everyone saw this one. It's in Dean's collection. It's absolutely badass and it's gorgeous. So just kind of marvel at this piece from Marvel, I guess, bad pun. And we'll move on to the next one in the essence of time. <laughs> All right, <laughs> here we go. It is a beauty. It is. So this one was in Paul P's collection. And uh, so I picked this one for a couple of reasons. It um, initiated my fear of heights and initiated my tripophoria, which is the fear of irregular shapes, all in one piece. So for the anxiety that I'm looking at right now, I thought I'd feature it. 
plus you know it's done really really well and it's got some landscapes and some really cool city effects but yeah i felt actually kind of queasy when i saw this piece in this gallery so i thought it'd be perfect to feature gives a bit of that vertigo effect a little you know it's cool yeah yeah i'm getting nauseous phil we got to move on <laughs> All right, and and uh, to answer the question, it was not a uh, X Men piece. It was actually a, but it was a John Byrne FF page with no FF on it. It's the only way I could afford it, but uh, a very early one too. So I was like, Mike, where, where, you know, I just found this. Where, what the heck? And he's like, ah, I didn't even know I had that. And then I dropped it. So yeah, it's mine. Uh, anyway, we're going on to our final topic, and Mikhail, this one's all yours. All right, this will be. Uh pretty quick um and then we can take some questions if there are any um let me just say start off by prefacing this to say that i am an amateur uh seller of art i don't do it very often um so i have time to uh mess around a little bit as well but when i sh uh, we're talking about shipping art by the way um i had some pieces to ship after dueling dealers and um i just thought i'd run people through my process and then see what you know pet peeves or tips other people may have to help make the process a little bit easier and um, secure because nobody wants to get a package that's been poorly prepared or um, that's not been treated very well on way, on route. So um, I'm gonna do a uh, slideshow and just kind of talk about the process. And uh, I've used a piece that's sold on Dueling Dealers to our friend uh, Anchor. And I guess that's public record, so we'll use him as our guinea pig. So um, this is the piece. I, if it fits into a um, top loader, I will ship it to you in a top loader. I will ship in top loaders all day long, but there are thousands of pieces of art that just will not fit into a top loader. I don't know why. So, um, and in this case, what I'm gonna do is use uh, two pieces of a uh, hard board. And this comes from uh, Dave at the Jade Giant who has been shipping super secure. Every time I get a package from him, I feel compelled to tell him what a great job he did. So it's just two pieces of board. I never cut uh, all four sides. I only ever cut three sides. So you keep like a hinge if you're gonna reuse it. So it fits very nicely. You've got some area around it so that if someone's using a blade, they don't get too close to the art. Uh, the pajamas are coming, Dino, don't worry. Um, I have black tape in my uh, tape loader, and I encourage everyone to please make a tab so that it's easier to find the tape and take it off, and you use less pressure, and it's less detrimental to the uh, covering on the art and the art itself. So if you make a tab that helps the person find out where it's supposed to go, uh, in which direction to take it off, it makes it a lot easier, I feel. So you do the bottom, you do the top. I put in some markers so you know which direction to go in, just because again, OCD, lots of time. And then uh, you close down the top, and then you put in a, uh, an address marker. And I, again, like to give it a little bit of a touch. There's a couple of reasons for this. Um, sometimes people have said, please ship it nondescript, don't indicate what's in it, that's fine too. But uh, for the most part, I think if you give your package a bit of personality, it's just that less likely to be tossed or mishandled. I think if, imagine these guys who are handling thousands of packages every day, just even something that goes across their hands that catches their interest for a second. Um, you know, that's, I think, very um, beneficial and just helps. And then if you're someone who gets a lot of art, it's always nice to know what's in the package. Uh, you know, if you're getting multiple pieces in, uh, I can't imagine that situation, but. And uh, Tatiana, this is in a, in a sleeve, it's in a top loader. So you put the uh, thing on, tape it down. Then you uh, bind, the, bind it up. So I just like to overhang the piece, go over, wrap the bottom, do the top. And the thinking here is, always assume that the piece is gonna get soaked in water. Just this, imagine that this is gonna be dunked in water. That's the way I approach it. It has to survive at least that. So I'm gonna steal all the sides, overlay it, fold it around, 
that's one side, do the other side. And then what I've done here is at the bottom, I've uh, sealed it up along the bottom. Then at the back, it's pretty much ready to go, but you go around once more just to make sure there's no loose edges that might catch on something and rip away. Flip it in front, it's basically ready to go. But again, if you have five seconds, you just make it all black like a garbage bag. And uh, instructions. Oh, that's, that's a label on the front. That's, <laughs> that's not the part that's facing us. Yeah, obviously, that's the label. So yeah, that's, that's how this package would go out. And then um, I have a quick, uh, this is very similar, but in this one, I'm going to reuse a packaging that I got from Felix, who has a great top loader. Um, again, you just find something that fits the artwork and make sure that it uh, is waterproof. So in this case, this piece is already waterproof. It goes into, onto a supporting board, into the uh, top loader. That's my trusty tape. Tape up the uh, top loader. Put on a personalized uh, address. Tape it down. Corners, sides, finish. That's the back. That's my pool. So that's how I like to approach shipping. It um, kind of solves a lot of problems, make sure the art isn't going to get uh, water damaged. And yeah, I think I like to make it as easy as possible. Um, and I, especially in the first um, example, I make it so that the packaging is reusable. So the, all the uh, uncle has to do is take a uh, quarter inch blade, go around all three sides, flip it open, the art's gonna come out and you can put something else in there, close it, do the three sides and he's ready to go. So that's kind of my approach to it. Masonite so, is best, I like Masonite. Great. I was going to say, uh, if you guys have ever uh, bought electronics and have that clear plastic film that's just uh, a joy to pull off, that same feeling uh, you get when you get a package from Mikhail. It's just a joy to open. Well, I also like to make it special. Again, I'm not, and again, I'm, no professional dealer is going to sit and do all of this. Um, but for me, every piece is very special. And when I'm sending it to a new home and when, I, when it's being received, I want even that process of opening it should be very interesting. And uh, part of the process, and especially if you've spent hundreds or thousands of dollars or something, you know, it's, you're waiting for the package, it comes, it's in good shape. Um, and yes, it should definitely be waterproof. Right, I've never had an issue with somebody shipping in Masonite. And, uh, and that Albert ships pretty well too. He uses some kind of super sturdy cardboard. Um, I, I don't know where he gets it, but so that's a good alternative as well. But I agree. Yeah, yeah, I, think, I think you 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 use your common sense, right? You know if that board is, mm -hmm. is stiff and stable, and and I cannot tell you how many packages I've gotten with a literal bootmark on it at some point. You know, like you see it all the time. Um, so I, I just I have to assume that it, it's going to be handled poorly. I think, uh, and and you guys can comment too if you've ever gotten a package um, that was poorly uh, prepared. I mean, you kind of that reflects back on the seller big time and whether or not you want to do business with them in the future, not just a dealer, but any type of private collector. So if you're someone who wants to continually you know, turn your art through sales and acquisitions, I mean, packaging is an important piece. And that's that kind of word of mouth gets around as well. And, no, and can we true. please talk about the fact that you, sh you, should, you should never ship original art in a tube? Very true. I've gotten <laughs> more than one page that way with all of the all of the balloons having uh, fallen off because it's been curled and all of the uh, all of all of the glue that was holding the balloons in place uh, it, they just all popped off because you just curled it and uh, you have to put it under heavy weights for a couple of years before it actually flattens ever again. I think that that really came from a different era when so much work, I mean, you know, pre-comics, when so much work was on canvas and your, your de facto kind of way to, to move canvas was to roll it. And I, yeah, I just don't understand when people roll paper. It just doesn't make sense to me. You don't see it too often, thankfully, but uh, I had a younger artist, you know, who sent me something and it was rolled. Um, 
right? That's what Joe yeah, was just saying. Artists, yeah. I, I'd have to agree. No knock on the artist, but yeah, and sometimes it's not an artist. You know, that's why they benefit from having a rep to kind of do that for them. Mm-hmm. Yep, uh, that's very true. Just looking through the rest of the comments to see if we missed anything. But yeah, tubes are bad. I've gotten a few things in tubes, but nothing with word balloons on them because, yeah, that's a guaranteed way of having those word balloons come off. That's terrible. All right. So let's see. We've got uh, Ruben. Ruben, you get to show us your – talk about your artwork that you selected. All right. Man, the way James blew through his two, I'm like, oh, my God, i got to do it fast. Wow. No, no, no. <laughs> you're, uh, you're a lot more educated on this than I am. All right, so the first thing I want to nice. say, this is a beautiful piece, and I figured Mikhail, of all of you, would probably enjoy it the most and appreciate it the most. Um, Mikhail, I'm not sure if you know, but um, I don't know if you know if you read the comment I left on the owner's, oh, sorry, I'm so sorry. Can I, can we say, do you have his name, Bill? Michael? Can I say Greg? No, no. All right, have to, hang on a second, I'll get the owner's name. I'm so sorry, I meant to write it down and, uh now, keep, go ahead and keep talking. I'll get it. Yeah. I'll, yep, I'll okay. pull it up here in a um, second. Anyways, I had, I had mentioned that I uh, have never read a word of Sandman in my life. Um, I don't know anything about it. It was just a, it was a genre that just it does not appeal to me. So I, I did not, you know, it's not something that ever appealed to me to even attempt to read. Um, but that doesn't what, mean... What, good writing? <laughs> was that you, Michael? Uh, M- Michael Ingram. <laughs> yes, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mikhail. Um, yeah, um, so, but, but, you know, that doesn't mean that I cannot appreciate artwork despite, you know, wherever it comes from. I don't, I don't, I don't you know, I don't have to collect a, a title or read a title to appreciate the art from it. Um, I mean, I, there's so much going on here. It's so, so much beauty here. Uh, I mean, the first thing that caught my eye, of course, was uh, I've always been a big fan of, uh, Never really cared much for sports cars, but always loved old classic type cars. And this Roadster was just gorgeous. Um, and I love the, um, the, the, the sort of uh, lighter blue and white highlights uh, that he laid down on the front fenders, uh, on the front end, around the lights. Um, it's, it's one of those things where when you, when you see this piece, if you, if, you were, if you had the opportunity to look at it up close and you look at those highlights on the front end of the car, right, from close up, you're like, Oh, this doesn't, you know, it looks, it just looks like some, some quickly slap dash, you know, brushed on, uh, um, whiter and lighter blue, uh, uh, paint. But when you step back and you look at it, you know, at arm's length distance, it, it, it's just magnificent. And really, it really, the, the, the effect of the, um, uh, the, the light reflection is really captured magnificently there. Um, and then you start looking around, first of all, the colors in general, all very complementary to each other. Nothing clashes. Um, you get a lot of separation between foreground, middle ground, background. Um, very whimsical, so it's got that sort of aspect to it. And of course, I guess it's um, because of the the, uh, the subject matter. Um, now, not, not having been, um, uh, you know, never having immersed myself into this title, I don't know anything about what's sort of going on, and I guess you readers would, would be able to tell me, uh, uh, you know, what all these things mean, but I just sort of love the fact that um, Sandman is just chilling in the back with a bloody hand and a severed head floating by singing. I'm like, what the hell is this? But, like, it's so cool, you know? Pumpkin head kid at the, at the, the bottom corner. I mean, yeah, I don't know, you know, death in the, in the, on top of the mountain sitting, sitting all chill and relaxed. Yeah, so I, I don't know anything about the title, but I, I just I love the 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 imagery, like everything about this is just fantastic, and and it's just really so Ruben. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so does this make you now want to go and read it? Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, as soon as uh, Ruben uh, shared this choice with us, I wrote to him immediately to say thank you for remembering this piece because. Uh, I saw it on uh, when uh, Duncan Figueredo uh, showed it on social media, and um, I didn't know that it had already popped up on Cap. So I was thrilled to see it. And to anyone who was thinking about hitting him up, by the way, he posted it saying, I took this insane commission and I'm never going to do anything like this again. So don't get your hopes up. <laughs> but it's a phenomenal piece. I think the execution, with, and you know, to, to draw in a non-Sandman 
person and to get them to look at all the elements, you know, beyond just the initial impact of the page, I think it really speaks to the work. And Duncan Sagredo is just a phenomenal painter. I think he has such a great, um, he has so many multiple styles that he can do with brushes. He can do very fine work like this and he can do chalkier, more blocked out work as well. I thought fantastic example. And, and was, was, I, was I correct then, Mikhail, in assuming that like all the little, all the little things like, you know, the, the severed head floating by and, and all those little elements, are those like things they're that all have characters. to various stories? Yeah, they're all characters. So okay. the, the head is singing because it's uh, Morpheus' son who's a severed head who sings and, you know, you can't show his lyre or any of the uh, surrounding uh, accoutrement that show, you know, his sim symbology. So I think the uh, singing was a way to kind of get that across. Okay. Um, but yeah, everyone's a character, everyone's very important and really skillfully, I think, interwoven into the piece. Fantastic, yeah, loved it. All right, and your next artwork. All right, yeah, uh, Terry and the Pirates uh, from Jeff Singh's collection. So, you know, everything that I want to say about this, you can actually read in his description because he, he everything that he loves about it is exactly what I noticed and I love about it. Um, but if I could just do it real quickly, um, the, the, the key salient points here is that we start in the left panel, right? Um, well, first of all, you look at it, uh, the two end panels are a little bit lighter than the two middle panels, right? So it's kind of like if you're starting from the left, it sort of goes up, 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 up in terms of getting darker and then sort of comes down a little bit and gets lighter again, which sort of reminds me of, you know, the, the uh, descent, uh, um, takeoff and, and landing of an airplane, which of course we see in the first uh, panel. Um, and the other thing is in that first panel, if you all look right to the bottom corner, there's like a little sort of almost semicircle, a blob of black deep down in that, in that first panel's right hand corner. And it, when you look at that in your uh, peripheral vision, it, it, it kind of, your brain kind of fills in. It, it makes you feel like it, it's almost a part of the shoulder of Terry in the second panel. And so it leads your eye upwards, diagonally towards Terry into that panel. Of course, there's a lot of beautiful uh, chiaroscuro here in, those, in, in, in that second panel with uh, the co-pilot hotshot, just very natural relaxed body position and just I just love the naturalness of it kicking back with the pipe in his mouth um, and then the other thing again what happened with that that sort of symbiosis between first and second panel the way it leads into it if you look at the the uh, so hot shot the guy with the pipe in his mouth um, if you look at the back of his seat right if you follow it from bottom and then upwards towards the back of his head, it looks like it it looks like it leads into and becomes the panel right the control panel of terry in the third panel so again it's, it's leading the eye from one panel to the next you know um so i just like i like i like when you and when you look at that and if you see that once you see that that um you know if you're staring at the third panel and you see the the airplane cockpit's control panel it does appear as if it's part of uh, Hotshot's chair, the back of his chair in the second panel, and you, and you step back and you look at the whole thing, suddenly it looks like the second and third panel are almost like one larger panel with two guys flying the plane and two guys in the back seats. It's just really, just really interesting the way he, he designed the, <clears throat> the whole concept of it. And of course, the, you, you, you lead back into the, the, the scene changes into the, the, the fourth final panel, um, which of course, it's a, it's a different scene or whatever. But uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I wanted to say about it. Like I said, read, read Jeff's description. It's, uh, it's pretty awesome. Nice. That I need to get a, a cool in my collection. Though. Sorry? That last panel is pretty interesting, though. It's got a lot of uh, stuff going on and a lot of detail and motion just in one piece. And all I said was, Kniff, it has to be added to my collection soon. Oh. Yeah. No, yeah, there's, then, plenty, there's, plenty, you, you there's know, a the, lot out there. Yeah, the thing is, that's exactly it, right? So you've got a lot of choice. That's the nice thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. very true. All right. all right. Well, we did it. We got our fourth right. fourth episode in the books, gentlemen. This was a lot of fun. Awesome. It was. And very good. Yeah. Um, you know, again, uh, nature of the show is to have a rotating panel. So if anyone in the chat, you know, 
wants to share their voice, uh, wants to be a part of the discussion, you know, reach out to Bill and, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, Michael and Ruben being on for the first time, thank you very, very much. Uh, you guys are fantastic. It's always nice to just get a different perspective. Oh, yeah. I agree. Yeah, I, I, and I, I really, like I said uh, to you guys in the, uh, the email before the show, man, I, when I, when I uh, read Michael's uh, email about what he was going to do, I was like, no, that's a two-hour show all by itself. I want to do that for two hours. Let's talk about that, you know? So, yeah, I could keep going on that just alone, man. So, oh, I wish we could do it more. Oh, well. Your, your passion is contagious. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to put a knife on some pieces right now. <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't catch that. I'm going to go snipe on some pieces right now. Uh, do it, baby. Do it. <laughs> yep, just not on Comic Connect. All right. Well, <laughs> I'm calling it a wrap this evening. They won't let you. <laughs> and we'll, just, you, just to respond to Tatiana, yes, I look forward to seeing you soon, too. <laughs> oh. Yes. All right. Well, then uh, we'll be back next week. I can't tell you who the uh, team will be, but I'm sure you'll see some familiar faces and hopefully a few new ones as well. And, and like James said, shoot me an email, bill at comicartfans.com. If you're interested in uh, taking part in one of these, if you've got some, uh, even if you just have suggestions for topics you would like us to cover, <clears throat> I'm keeping a list of that running so that I, I can share with everybody when they're searching for topics on what other, other people would like to see. So, you know, just uh, let us know. We're enjoying the show. It's uh, become one of the popular additions to what we've been doing on Comic Art Live, too. It's always one of the more viewed. After Dueling Dealers, this is like number two now. So, you guys, this show is beating out my two talk shows. Nice. So, wow. Yeah, wow. And I don't mind that. I think it's great. I mean, this is a, a collector perspective is really something that we need in this hobby. And, you know, we can, we can hang out in all the social media places and chat boards, but this is a little bit more engaging. And, and like everybody said, it's... It, it, I've, anybody that I've talked to about the show in general that thinks the shows are too long, they never watch them live. They don't really understand that the shows are important because of the engagement with the audience and the, the conversations that happen between people in the audience, not even engaging with us, that makes this show really special and all the shows that we do really special. So that's uh, that's the, the one thing that I, I really appreciate the most about this. It's not just sharing time with the people on screen, but watching the, the things going on on the chat as well. So. Thank you so much to everybody for always participating in these in that way. Happy Memorial Day. Remember yeah, our truth. We, we, uh, next year, uh, we're, we can't be gentlemen being responsible during COVID. We're going to be the de degenerates who are ignoring our families on the Sunday of Memorial Day. <laughs> Quite true. All right, everybody. Thanks again for tuning in. And thanks for being a part of the show, guys. We'll uh, see everybody next week. <laughs>